All right. Um, let's get started here. So I have not finished everybody's um, test two yet. Um, I still have a few more to go. Uh, so what I'm going to do for that is um, after I'm done, um, I'm going to do the same thing as as last time where I you will see like your raw score and then you will see like what percentage that is out of 100. Um, and then what I'll do is I will create a video, um, put it online, and I will walk through how to solve every one of those problems as uh, from the, I've got through most of the tests and yeah, seems like a lot of those problems cause uh, people problems. So um, I'll show you how to do those because we, like I said, in chemistry, uh, things we learn one week, we keep applying those week after week after week. So um, a lot of the skills we learn will, will probably show up again. Um, and they'll definitely show up on the final as well. Um, in case you're wondering, I will throw a curve on this test. Um, I have to decide what that curve is. Haven't quite decided yet. Um, of course, you'll also get the extra credit if you visited our, um, uh, our, our TA sessions with uh, Michael. Uh, so I'm still waiting on the list from him so I can assign the extra credit uh, for that as well. Um, when I make the tests available, um, and I hopefully, you know, I should get that all done today. Um, if you have questions about how I scored something, or you want to say, well, you scored it this way, and I think I should get more points because of that, um, feel free to send me an email. I'm always happy to have those discussions. Um, I'm always happy if people want to argue um, if they feel they deserve more points because of some logical reason. Um, so I'll be happy to uh, talk with you over that. Um, but yeah, that, like I said, hopefully they'll all become available. Um, this afternoon. Also, what I will do is after um, I put those grades up, I will, you know, I'll let them sit for like a little bit. And then I'm going to show you what your grade looks like if I drop the lowest test already. So we have two tests in, right? And I said, I'm going to drop your lowest test score. Well, with Blackboard, that's super easy. So of the two tests you've done so far, uh, so far, what I'll do is I'll just um, drop the lowest one so far so you can get an accurate representation of your grade as today is like uh, when midterms are due. So you'll be able to, our midterm grades. Um, so you'll be able to see what your midterm grade actually is. Um, and Blackboard's nice in that I can keep updating um, which test is dropped. So when we take test three, um, if, if you do worse on it than test one and test two, then I can easily update it where now test three is dropped and now test two becomes um, uh, part of your real grade again. Um, but yeah. Uh, but that's that's all I really wanted to um, say about the tests right now. Um, as usual, there was like two camps: people who who like really got the problems, and then um, yeah, those of us who didn't. But I I don't want to harp too much on that because it's going to be the same speech I gave in test one. Um, but anyways, I do want to get to um, our lecture now as. You know, the arrow of time keeps moving forward. So we have to keep going on. But if, like I said, if you do have questions about that, feel free to um, shoot me an email. Or if it's a general question that you that uh, you want to ask, you can ask me right now as well. Okay, so let me get the slideshow up. So all the way back on Monday, uh, what we were talking about was Dalton's law of partial pressures, where when we use the ideal gas law, we can calculate the pressure um, 
of, of, sam of a mixture of gases. And if we look at each individual gas, we can get the pressure of the whole um, gas mixture. And then we can calculate mole fraction, which is just the number of moles of that particular gas divided by all the moles of a gas. And again, all of that is done using PV equals NRT. Basically, whenever we have a gas problem, for the most part, we're going to use PV equals NRT to solve it, right? And so we looked at um, um, just a question that talks about, you know, what's the total pressure, mole fraction, mass percent, or what, not mass percent, uh, mass of each gas. Yep. Then we went into collecting gases over water, where if you collect gas over water, you'll have vapor pressure as, or sorry, a water vapor as your um, other component of your gas mixture. The amount of gaseous water that is there is dependent on temperature and the pressure from um, steam, basically. Um, we call that the vapor pressure. And then we had a problem here where I take a penny, um, I take and I dissolve it, I get hydrogen gas, I give you total pressure, I give you partial pressure of water or the vapor pressure and ask you how much hydrogen gas is collected. So um, that is the last problem we, we ended up on, on Monday. Now what we're gonna get into is stoichiometry again. So um, uh, test two was actually a lot of stoichiometry uh, and stoichiometry is not going away. So if you didn't quite get it for aqueous systems, well, we're gonna give another uh, go at it with gas systems. So again, I just have a generic um, chemical equation. Molecule A plus molecule B will make molecule C plus molecule D. The number in front here is just N, but N would actually be a number. Those are our stoichiometric coefficients. So stoichi stoichiometric coefficients. And they tell us how many molecules or how many moles are interacting in a reaction. And the way we used it for aqueous systems, uh, one example of it, is that let's say we know the mass of um, compound A. And let's say we want to know how much compound B we need to interact with our mass of compound A. FYI, that was basically question one on our test yes, our uh, Wednesday. So what we do is first we convert uh, the mass of compound A to moles of compound A, all right? And we do that using the molecular weight. Remember, molecular weight, I'm gonna call it MW here, is the way we convert between mass and moles, right? Then, once we're in moles, we can go to any other substance, any other element in this chemical equation. And we use that using the stoichiometric coefficients. So these numbers tell us how to convert between compound A and compound uh, B. So using those coefficients, we can change between uh, different, uh, different molecules in our reaction. And then using the molecular weight, we can go from moles of B to mass of B. Right. So that's what we did in solution. Here for gases, it's the same idea, except when you're measuring a gas, you don't measure the mass of the gas. You measure the pressure. So the pressure or the volume or possibly the temperature, if you know those, but usually the pressure or the volume of a gas will directly give you mass. And from there, we can do the same, same steps where we, we start with a uh, known, known quantity of A and we're trying to find a quantity of B or C or D. Any of those elements, we can, we can switch between. 
So that's that's stoichiometry again. And so we're going to do a problem with uh, stoichiometry, um, gas stoichiometry. And I'm, I'm going to do this one um, and explain every single step. Um, like I said, I saw test two, and I have a feeling there's still a lot of confusion about stoichiometry. So um, let's let's walk through this together, right? So um, in cars, we have airbags, and those airbags inflate um, upon a uh, big impact. And what actually happens in that impact is that we have a a solid, right? NaN3. Uh, sodium azide, I believe is what it's called. And what happens is that we have a reaction in which this solid breaks down to make sodium in nitrogen gas. So it's this nitrogen gas that inflates or creating this nitrogen gas is what inflates our airbag. And yeah, so that's, that's how airbags work. You take a solid and you just, you just split it apart to make a gas and another solid. So let's say that we have an airbag that has a volume of 11.8 liters. Okay, so let me just pause here. So we are working with gases. This is the gas chapter. Whenever we're working with gases, I find it very helpful to always keep in mind my equation, All right? So I'm gonna be using the ideal gas law here, PV equals NRT. So if a bag has a volume of 11.8 liters, so that's my V of this. Um, so there's my V. What mass of sodium azide NaN3, so that's, that's what I wanna find out, is required to fully inflate this airbag upon impact? Assume STP conditions. So standard temperature and pressure, right? So STP, pressure, is one atmosphere. Temperature is 273K or zero C. All right, so if we look at our PV equals NRT, we have a pressure, we have a volume, we have a gas constant, because that's given, and we have a temperature. The only thing we don't have in this problem are number of moles, all right? Um, so just conceptually, this is what we're going to do, just without any numbers. We're going to use PV equals NRT to solve for number of moles, where I'm going to rearrange this equation by dividing each side by RT to get N equals PV divided by RT. So that'll give us numbers of moles of a gas. Which gas, you might be asking? Here, it's the only gas in the whole reaction, right? Um, so this one is easy. So we're solving for moles, number of moles of N2, right? Because N2 is a gas. This equation is only useful for gases. You might be asking yourself, how do I know which gas it is if I have multiple gases? Um, if that's the case, each individual gas would have its own pressure and so you'd use that to solve for N, all right? So conceptually, we're gonna solve for number of moles of N2, all right? Now, we're, once we're in N2, we have to look at what is the problem asking us? What is the mass of NaN3? Well, we have a balanced equation, so that's relatively simple to do if we have moles of N2, because moles of N2, we can convert to moles of NaN3 using stoichiometry. And then we can go to weight of NaN3 using molecular weight. And that should give us our answer in grams. All right, before I actually throw numbers up here, does anyone have questions about conceptually what this question is asking or conceptually how I attack this problem and or our, what our workflow is. Any questions about that or did I lose anybody during that explanation or does anybody want me to say anything again?
why you put number of moles as N2? Because PV equals NRT is the ideal gas equation, right? So when you solve that, you're always solving for a gas. If you look at our equation, we have a solid, a solid, and a gas. So the only thing we can solve for is N2 when we do PV equals NRT, right? And if we look at the question as is, we're doing this reaction to inflate an airbag. The way the airbag gets inflated is by inserting a gas into it, right? So our gas has to be N2. And so if we know the pressure of the gas, if we know the volume of the gas, if we know the temperature of the gas, which is given in the question, we can solve for the numbers of moles of that gas using our ideal gas law and then work backwards or not backwards, but work from there to get to Na N3. Does that make a little sense? Why we're solving for uh, moles of N2? And that G is gas, that's not grams. So let's actually put some numbers to this then. BV equals NRT, right? So P is one atmosphere. Volume is 11.8 liters. N, we don't know. Uh, gas, or the gas constant, 0 0.08206. Temperature, 273. Rearrange it to say N equals one times 11.8 divided by 0.08206 times 273. Numbers of moles of gas is 0 0.527 moles of N2. So that's the ideal gas law for us. Now, stoichiometry, right? So I'm just following, I'm gonna switch pen because I'm using a lot of black. So let me go to red. I'm just following this, this workflow, okay? So I have number of moles of N2, 0 0.527 moles of N2, right? Ultimately, I wanna solve for uh, sodium azide, NaN3. So first, once I'm in moles of one element, I can go to any other element in that reaction using stoichiometry. So stoichiometry is our, our um, conversion factor. And our equation says for every three moles of N2 gas, I make two moles of sodium azide. So I have moles of N2 at the top of my train tracks that cancels with the moles of N2 at the bottom of my train tracks. And my units are now moles of sodium azide. Um, and while, while I'm here, I think this is very good practice for everybody. When you see a chemical equation, I want you to start saying what that means in, in English. Start translating those numbers and letters into English or Spanish, whatever language you're, you're most comfortable with. It does not matter to me. And what I mean by translating it is this, this is a sentence. Two moles of NaN3 solid makes two moles of sodium solid plus three moles of nitrogen gas. So it's very hard to do chemistry if we can't translate these uh, letters and numbers into a meaningful sentence. So whenever you see a chemical reaction, you should be translating that. Anyways, back to the matter of hand. Um, we are now in moles of sodium azide. Once you're in moles, you can work towards grams using molecular weight. So you would look that up on the periodic table. Um, I already have it solved. Um, so I'm not gonna spend too much time like rehashing that, but one mole of sodium azide. So moles of sodium azide at the top, moles of sodium azide on the bottom, those units cancel out is 65.01 grams sodium azide. Multiply everything on the top, divide by everything on the bottom, and 
to do this reaction, to inflate this airbag, your car must have at least 21.8 grams of sodium acide. So that's how we solve that, that question. So any questions about what I did there, about stoichiometry, about anything? Where did I lose you? Where did your mind start going blank? Where did I stop speaking English? Uh, 65.01 is the molecular weight. Yep, 65.01 grams per mole. That is correct. You mean where I got like three moles of N2 to two moles of N3 or the moles of PV equals N or T? Since there's actually like kind of like two moles. The first one, the first, <laughs> I should, uh, sorry. I'm gonna write it down because it's kind of hard, you know. Number one or number two now? Number one or number two? Like equation number one or equation number two? Number one, okay, fantastic. So what's going on there is I'm solving for the ideal gas law, right? PV equals NRT. This only solves for gases. So in my equation, I only have one gas. So I know this is um, solving for N2. When reading through this question, um, I know to use PV equals NRT, um, one, because we're in the gas chapter, two, whenever we're using gases, whenever I'm asking you to solve for something that has like gas and it's an amount of gas, that's always the ideal gas law. We'll not use any other equation than the ideal gas law, right? So. I, I read my, my problem and I see from STP, my pressure is one atmosphere. My temperature is 273, the volume of my bag to 11.8, right? So I have a pressure, I have a volume, I have a temperature and I have a gas constant. So looking at my PV equals NRT equation, I only have one unknown. So I just rearrange that equation to solve for that unknown. N equals PV divided by RT. And that's how I solve for moles of N2. All right, and I know it's N2 because it's the only gas. And if you had multiple gases, the, the, the gas you're solving for depends on what pressure, right? And that goes back to what we were talking about on Monday with partial pressures. Does that make sense? Why were you saying that equation? How we solve that equation? All right. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, and I just want to reiterate. So again, if I ever lose you at a point, feel free to just say, hey, um, I'm, I'm lost. Um, and again, if you do not want to share that with people, because I know... Um, yeah, it can sometimes be embarrassing to talk to everybody who's like, um, there's, there's a real fear among not only students, people in general to look like dumb um, by asking questions. Uh, so you can always private message me. And, I, and I'll say, as always, asking questions not, does not make you dumb. What makes you dumb is not asking questions. Um, because if you knew everything, like I said, if you didn't have any questions, then you should be, you, you would be teaching this class more or less. There would be no reason for you to be in this class. So do not hesitate. Okay. So the last thing on this, um, this PowerPoint is kinetic molecular theory. Uh, basically how we think of gases. Like in, in the chemistry world, how do we think of gases? How do gases interact? And that's this kinetic molecular theory. And there's only three principles to this theory. One, gases don't occupy a volume. So when we talk about a gas molecule, 
it's basically does not exist in that it doesn't take up volume. Um, and this is actually a valid assumption. So let's say we are at STP and we just had a balloon full of argon. If we gathered up all the atoms in that balloon, they would only take up 0.01% of that balloon. So individual gas atoms are so small, we basically say uh, we don't care about their volume. They have no volume. So the second principle is that their energy, their movement energy, that is their kinetic energy is proportional to their temperature, which is valid. Basically what that says is that the hotter it is, the more energy they have, the more movement energy they have. The colder it is, the less movement energy they have. Um, so kinetic energy, you can just think of that as like I said, movement energy, energy to move. Um, this does not mean speed though, right? So kinetic energy is not the same as velocity because we have a different equation for kinetic energy. One half mass times velocity squared. Um, and we'll get into this later today, actually, uh, but if we have, if we get there, um, but we're just saying, you know, the hotter a gas is, the more kinetic energy it has. Um, our last principle is that when gases hit something, they bounce perfectly off. They don't ever lose energy. And our example of this are uh, pool balls or billiard balls. They have what are called elastic collisions. When two billiard balls hit, right, they bounce off each other. And we're assuming gases work the same way. An inelastic collision would be like two pieces of paper coming and hitting each other. They just kind of stop and crash into each other and then they don't move. So that's an inelastic collision. But we're saying gases have elastic collision. So again, we have three assumptions for how gases work that will explain you know, gases behavior. One, they have no volume. Two, their kinetic energy is related to their temperature. Three, their collisions are elastic. Uh, no, Charles' law is uh, something completely different. Charles' law is basically when I change the pressure, how does the volume change? This is just saying, how do gases behave? And that's and gases behave by not having a volume by uh, having more kinetic energy at higher temperatures and by having a list elastic collisions. So Charles' law is an actual calculation. This is more of a um, overarching theory to describe how gases behave in our world. That's, that's how I would describe those two. Like I said, don't, 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 don't say sorry for asking a question. Never say sorry for asking a question. All right. So I do have some, some questions to go with this. And I think I have a poll. Yeah. So I have three questions, A, B, and C. And they all relate to this idea. I have a one liter sample of helium gas and a one liter sample of argon gas. They are at the same temperature and same atmospheric pressure. So based on what I just said in the last slide, see if you can apply that to these questions. So I'm gonna launch that poll now and the poll does have the repeat of the questions as well. So if I have argon gas and helium gas at the same pressure, same volume and same temperature, what can I say about these gases? So see if, if what I said on the last slide made sense to you by answering these questions.
Okay, I'll just give them um, like 20 more seconds or so. All right, so let's take a look at this. So atom, so we have argon atoms and helium at atoms. Do they have the same average kinetic energy if they are at the same pressure, volume, and temperature? And the answer is yes, they do. So the correct answer is they do. So any gas, right, does not matter what the gas is. On our previous slide, we said that the kinetic energy is proportional to temperature, right? Does not matter what gas you're looking at in our, in our world. So argon gas, helium gas, silver gas, as long as the temperature is the same, they will always have the same kinetic energy or average kinetic energy. Do the atoms in helium and argon have the same average velocity? They do not. Again, that goes back to kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is based on two things. It's based on mass and based on velocity, right? So helium and argon are different weights. So if they have the same kinetic energy, but different weights, and I'm gonna write down the equation, right? Kinetic, uh, kinetic energy equals one half mv squared. So if they have different masses, but the same kinetic energy, they must have different velocities. It's the only way that that can work, right? So they have the same kinetic energy, average kinetic energy, but different velocities. Lastly, argon atoms are more massive. Therefore, do they exert a greater pressure? No, they don't. When we talk about gases, again, we don't care what the gas is unless we're looking at specific properties that we're gonna talk about here in a minute. But things like pressure, things like volume, does not matter what the gas is. So even though argon atoms are heavier, they are moving slower, right? So that evens out when they hit the wall. They hit, they hit um, uh, the container of the wall with the same force as the lighter helium atoms because the lighter helium atoms are moving faster, right? So th some things to take away from this, right? Your temperature does, is proportional to your kinetic energy. Does not matter what the gas is, but does that, does, that does not mean all gases have the same velocity because kinetic energy is based on mass and velocity. And when we're looking at things like pressure and volume, we don't actually care what the gas is. We assume all gases behave the same. Questions about that idea? Um, I did not say it's at STP. Um, it does not, in, in this situation, when we're talking about ideal gases, it actually doesn't matter as long as I say, oh, uh, I didn't say it at STP. Okay, I'm reading it again. It's at room temperature. Room temperature is 25C, so it's not at STP. But if we're talking about ideal gases, as long as temperature, pressure, and volume are the same, I can pick like any numbers. Yeah, so um, had a question about greater mass and pressure. Yeah, so force, which is pressure, depends on two things, mass and velocity, right? So if you have like 
a a uh, one ton brick that hits you at like um, I don't know one meter a sec, uh, not not that fast, one like centimeter a second. So it's moving super slow. It would not hurt you at all. But if I threw a pebble, right, and I threw it like at two hundred miles per hour right at you, that would hurt a lot more. So. Yeah, uh, mass and velocity uh, depend uh, are what are calculated in force. Any other questions? All right, let's move on to um, our next PowerPoint. Well, it looks like one more question. No, yeah, stop sharing that. You can see my beautiful face again. My beautiful face, I got four hours of sleep because chihuahuas like to bark for no reason. All right. So we're going to continue. We're going to jump straight into kinetic molecular theory again. So we just said that uh, kinetic energy is proportional to temperature. We can actually put an equation to this. So our equation is your average kinetic energy is equal to three halves, or better known as 1.5, times RT. R is the gas constant, T is temperature. And if we want to know velocity, if we want to know how fast a gas is moving, that is the square root. So this, this is actually velocity, that, that Greek U. Square root of three times R times T times this M is molecular weight or mass, MW. So even though it's a weird looking M, that is just molecular mass. So we can actually put equations to average kinetic energy of a gas and the velocity of a gas. Yeah, so I do have like a um, black lab border collie. He does not bark ever, except if he gets really mad. A little chihuahuas bark at every little thing. All right, so our question here. What is the average kinetic energy and velocity of chlorine gas at room temperature at 25C? So um, time is running short, so um, and we're a little behind. So I'm not, I'm going to show you how to uh, go about this, right? So kinetic energy, that's simple, and this goes back to our previous, uh, just our last previous question. If you look at the kinetic energy equation, the only thing it depends on is temperature. There is nothing in there telling us the um, what gas we're working with. There's actually nothing in there telling us pressure or volume either. So kinetic energy really only matters what temperature it is. So if we do this, we do three halves times the gas constant, 8.314 times temperature. All right, let's look at our gas constant. Our gas constant has K in it, Kelvin, which means our temperature must be in Kelvin. Basically, from this point out, until you get to Gen Chem 2, there are some equations in Gen Chem 2 where we use Celsius. But basically, every time in, in chemistry, if you're given a temperature, just use Kelvin. All equations will work if you use Kelvin, unless you're using some weird American equation that uses Fahrenheit, which they don't really exist. So always being Kelvin, all right? So we have 25 Celsius plus 273 equals 298. So room, room temperature is 298 degrees, right? So uh, 3 halves times 8.314 times 298. That's how we solve for kinetic energy. And when we do that, if I did my math right, you should get 140 uh, joules per mole. That is our unit, joules per mole. How do we know that's our unit? Well, let's, let's look at what we're calculating. So the gas constant 
has uh, units of joules per mole Kelvin. Our temperature was in Kelvin. Kelvin on a denominator, Kelvin in the numerator, they cancel out. Our unit is joules per mole. All right, any questions about how we calculated average kinetic energy? Yes, there was a question. If so, what is it? Where did you get the R? That's on the bottom of the page. R is a gas constant. I will always give you R. So on test three, what's going to happen is I'll give you like a couple R's, right? And you have to pick which one to use. Uh, for average, um, did I calculate it wrong? I probably calculated it wrong. 3,716. Let, let me do that again. Um, basically, for using the average kinetic energy, this is the R you always want because it's in joules per mole. R is always constant, yes. Um, not sure what J is. I'm not sure what you mean by J. Um, let me just recalculate that. Um, equals 1.5 times 8.314 times 298. Yeah, I don't know where I got 100, 140 from. Jeez. Uh, yeah, it's 3,716. Oh, I must have completely just spaced out on that calculation. Uh, 3,716 joules per mole or 3.7 kilojoules per mole. Uh, that J, joule, um, so joule is um, J-O-U-L-E here. Uh, that's a unit of energy. So that is saying that gas has 3,700 joules. Um, you can kind of think of a joule like as a BTU if you like to grill. It's just a uh, unit of energy per mole of substance. So for every mole of gas, we have uh, 3,716 units of energy. All right, so that's, that's kinetic energy. Let's look at molecular velocity. Again, rather simple um, equation. There is one caveat, but let's 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 look at this equation. Square root of three times the gas constant times temperature divided by molecular weight, right? So you go up to your periodic table and you're looking for the molecular weight of chlorine, and then you multiply it by two. So the molecular weight of chlorine is 35.453. We take that and we multiply it by two. We multiply it by two because it's Cl2 gas. So 35.453 times two. So the weight of uh, chlorine gas is roughly 70.9. grams per mole. All right. Now here's the caveat. For molecular velocity, do not use grams per mole. The reason for that is because in our gas constant, our gas constant is joules per mole Kelvin. What a joule is, another way I can um, state the unit of a joule is that it is kilograms multiplied by meter squared divided by second squared. So that is, that, that's a unit of energy. It's how much weight I can move per distance per time. 
it's okay if you don't understand what I just said. And you do not need to memorize that one joule is kilograms, meter squared, second squared. That is not something that you have to memorize at all. What you need to know though, is when you're using the molecular velocity equation to make it make sense for your units to cancel out, you have to use kilograms per mole as your molecular weight. And this is the first time we've ever done this. So that's why I I'm, I'm, I'm want to like highlight that, right? Using kilograms per mole is the only way to get the correct units at the end of this equation. So chlorine gas isn't 70.9, well, it is 70.9 grams per mole, but we are gonna use the form of 0.079 kilograms per mole. That is how we're going to use the correct equation or use the equation correctly. So we're going to plug that in. So let's do that. So we have three times 8.314 times 298. Take that divided by 0 0.0709. Take that and take the square root of that, H4. And we get a speed of velocity of 323 meters per second. All right. How did I know it was meters per second? Let me, it, it's, it goes back to here where we have the square root of a unit that's kilograms meter squared. And this is gonna be really confusing. Uh, second squared um, mole Kelvin multiplied by something that's a Kelvin. Okay. Those are our actual units. And I'm sure that doesn't make much sense. Um, you really need to sit down and think about the units for that to make sense. So if these are the two things you really need to know about, about using the molecular velocity equation. One, your, your molecular mass needs to be in kilograms per mole. Two, the units you get out are always meters per second. So what this says is that at room temperature, uh, a chlorine gas molecule is moving 323 meters per second, which is incredibly fast. Let me just do a fun little calculation. 323 meters per second to miles per hour. Okay, so right now, the gas molecules flying around you are going 722 miles per hour, and they're hitting your body at a speed upwards and above 722 miles per hour. Reason why we don't feel it though is because they're so small, right? Uh, force equals mass times acceleration. So they're going incredibly fast. They're just incredibly small, so we don't feel it. So we ignore the whole equation because it basically means kilograms per mole because the meter squared, second squared are confusing. Um, let me, I, I will explain the units for those of us who like units. It's not so much you, you um, ignore it, um, but it's to, to do, to like understand this concept, you don't actually need to understand them, the, the units if you just want to memorize like, kilograms per mole goes, goes in and meters per second come out. But here are the units, right? So uh, R is joules per mole, right? Well, another way I can say joules is given down here where a joule is a kilogram meter squared divided by second squared, but we still have our, uh, the gas kind of is mole K, but we still have our mole K 
from our, 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 uh, our, our gas constant. So the full gas constant units are kilograms meter squared divided by second squared divided by mole divided by Kelvin. That these two units that I just wrote mean the same thing. We're taking that and we're multiplying by a temperature. So my Kelvin cancel out. We're taking this unit and we're dividing it by units that are kilograms per mole. When you do that, kilograms cancel out, moles cancel out. So my unit, after you're all done with your units, your units are the square root of meter squared divided by second squared. Well, if I'm taking the square root of these, of something that's squared, I'm just left with something that's meters per second. So that's why the units come out to be meters per second. And that's why um, they are kilograms per mole. Um, like I said, I'm never going to test you on that. That's, that's math class. That's 100% math class. I just want you to know in molecular velocity, use kilograms per mole and your answer is meters per second. But to figure that out, to know that's the case, you need to know that one joule is one kilogram meter squared second squared. Any other questions about this? Oh, all the scribblings I did here. All right, if not, like I said, um, I will, I will grade the rest of the test and um, hopefully, you know, you'll be able to see what, what your final score is on, on that. And uh, hopefully by the end of today, that's, that's the plan here. Um, I'll put a homework up. So you have two parts to do for this by Monday. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. So meeting with me, talk to me by email, that's fine. Um, otherwise, um, uh, that's all I have for you today. Uh, enjoy the rest of your Friday. Take a little time for yourself. And I will see people on Monday. All right. Take care, everybody.